in conclusion, I mean in the beginning. <laughs> Since I'm sure that some of you are interested in such inside gossip, for the last few weeks I have been gradually, and I started to say subtly, but at times I guess I can be too subtle is why I'm mentioning it now, trying to push your attention somewhere just in case this whole thing explodes on you. And one of the things that I'm trying to get some of you close to if I don't just go ahead and just, oh, let me make up a phrase, spill the beans, how about that? But one of the things I could point out is, in ways that you may, you may have thought I'd said this before, but it's not in exactly the way that you probably thought, but what I was going to say was, did you know that this could be, this, right now, all of it historically, everything that came before, everybody that's ever plowed through these same fields, could be a lot, I'm just saying it could be a lot more direct and simple than is usually thought, than is usually the way in which it's presented. Now, I don't mean in some pseudo-Zen fashion such as saying, hey, everything's just like it is and that's the secret. That that's how simple it is, that all this means nothing, everything I've said means nothing because it still doesn't change reality, right? And you go, well, that's it. <laughs> now, that sounds simple enough, but I'm talking about real simple. That's not simple enough. What if it's real simple? What if it's so simple, do I have to tell you the rest? What if it's so simple, it's why it has to be dressed up like it's Halloween. <laughs> Why it has to be dressed up. Oh, all right, why should I let Kairou do it all? Maybe I'll let him actually sit down and do it someday. But let me tell you a story. Okay, I got it. It's a real old story. <laughs> all right, now I got it. And it goes something like this. Take it. <laughs> there was this elevator. A run-of-the-mill elevator. You could not see anything extraordinary about the elevator, and I'm not insinuating there's anything extraordinary about the elevator. It ran to the top floor in a building that was of at least average size. Perhaps even it could go so far as to be slightly impressive height. An elevator ran to the top. And periodically, under certain circumstances like this, there are elevators that go even higher than the top floor of the building. And whenever that happens, without exception, those who believe they observe it, if it seems to come to their attention, it takes on. It does not astound people physically. They are not taken aback that in some way, intellectually, someone has figured out how to do this. Whenever this happens, anyone who notices it, at times large people think, numbers think they notice it, it takes on a spiritual quality. Because people don't know what else the hell to call it. <laughs> well, that's enough of those little funny prefaces. Real business. What if someone gave you a task, and the task was to guard this other person, that you are in charge, let me make it specific, you are in charge that this person, and we'll assume it's got to be a fairly important person, but this person, you are in charge, they go through a certain routine, there's a certain time, at least that they seem to be quite vulnerable as they come out during several hours out in this park near where they work and they walk around and get some exercise and sometimes sit down and read and your job is for a certain period of time you have got to watch them guard them and you do it from afar that's just part of the rule so they put you up in this fancy hotel room right there above the park so that at all times during these two hours you can see the person that you are guarding and it's very important most important job you've ever had. 
Now, when I say guard, you understand the first thing is you got to watch the person. They give you a fine telescope, binoculars, anything you want. And during that designated time, when you're in charge, you have got to watch the person, which is a form of guarding, to see that nothing happens. You've got a walkie-talkie, and there are the people hidden around, and so on. But your job specifically, you are the person watching, watching to see that no danger comes, approaching danger. All right, now, if that's your job, where do you look? I did. Line level consciousness, it would seem to be, may I suggest, at first a matter that we're back to this binary situation that you're either dealing with that there are only two possibilities of this or not not this. You can either be watching the person that you're supposed to be watching or not. And what's your possibilities? They say, they tell you, your job during this specified time is to watch the person. We've got to guard the person, and you're in charge of watching. You say, got it. And then they ask you, they said, uh, by the way, we're leaving you in charge, but I, I just got to ask you, where are you going to look during the time you're guarding the person, when you're in charge of watching them? Ordinary consciousness would tell you what? Well, if you're actually asking the question, that's kind of dumb because there's only two choices. I'm either going to watch the person or not watch the person. That's what you're paying me for. What's the possibilities? That you're back to the old game in the binary world of it's either this or not this. But let me point out to you that there is a third option. And in fact, it is the most efficient option, except it is not the way the ordinary intellect operates. And that would be what? It would be to watch around the person. What if the person comes out and they go through for this several hours or the times you're watching, they go through certain procedures. They stand, they walk, they run around in a circle, they bend over, they lay under a tree, they stand up, they walk some more. And there is the possibility of harm. And your job is to watch the person. A bird's eye view up there where you can see and notify the right other people that's helping guard if there's any problem. But now if you were going to do the most efficient job, would you in fact keep the telescope on the person wherever they went? If so, how much do you see what I'm going to get to? How much warning would you have if suddenly somebody rushes up, one of their foals with a knife to stab the person? I'm not going to stand here and try to figure out through trigonometry and magic, but if the person's a thousand yards away, how much would that be? How long would you have if you're keeping your eye right there on the person every time they move and suddenly somebody rushes on with a knife and they get within your field of vision? It's too late. So if you're going to actually do the best job of watching somebody, where would you look? You would continually look around them. Why the hell would you look at them? They're not paying you to watch the person make sure they don't try to commit Harry Carey. They're not going to commit suicide. What you would be doing is continually looking around wherever the person is. You would be guarding the envelope of their personal environment, but you would not look at the person. That would be folly. You would be nuts. You would not be doing an efficient job because you could say day after day if they ask you how did it go. You could say, I can assure you, other than normal blinking of my eyes, which I had to do, so-and-so never left my sight, was in the center of my vision. What kind of watching is that? What kind of protection? It is nil. The only way that you could properly watch somebody in the sense of helping protect them is not look at the person. You would continually have to be looking around the person at the immediate environment. Now, can any of you take the second view that you have to have of things and to see that that has absolute, immediate, full-time, hands-on pertinence 
in the way in which people think they're doing with themselves. How is it that people try and guard themselves? How is it people try and deal with themselves? How is it that you try at the ordinary level to change yourself by staring at yourself, that you're always in view? Now, I'll ask you no one. This is not to bring out any kind of gossip about you and I. At the times I go through certain, at least four dimensional, I give myself credit, fits of peak, or not being able to have some of you, when I say, meet me at 7.30 with a green shirt on at the corner of 7th and Purple Street, I'm asking too much. Because there are very few of you that on your own have stumbled on it. I've helped push some of you around to where you begin to get glimpses of it. You're not going to get anywhere by staring at that which you think you're watching. It's simply a fact. You can apparently continue to collect information or pick up phrases or pictures or metaphors you think that I came up with or somebody else came up with, but you cannot watch anything by looking at it. That is the most inefficient way possible, yet at city level, it's fine. They're not going to adopt anything different. Things work just as they're supposed to work. If I may turn another original phrase, things run just like, oh, I don't know, in the city, run just like clockwork. How about that? You don't have to look around. They can tell you, hey, you're in charge of watching so-and-so. Will you watch them so much an hour? Yeah. <laughs> Dental benefits? Yeah, okay, you got it. And they ask you, do you watch them? Watch them all the time. Well, they didn't get killed today, so you must be doing a good job. Right. And the person watching TV half the time, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but to do this, you got to watch around what you're doing. And for me to have the little periods when I seem to pick on some of you even individually and say, how in the world could you be so, be so, and sometimes I don't have my thesaurus with me and I have to say, oh, I don't know, dumb. <laughs> and you go, I don't know. And then some of you want to pull out a, your belt out of your pants and beat on yourself and holler, I think the same thing. Boy, am I, oh, I don't know, what was that word you said, dumb. Yeah, how can I be so dumb? Sometimes dumb is a real useful word, but there's another aspect of it. In times past, I tried to talk to some of you of a kind of omnidirectional consciousness, a kind of continual scanning of going through the day. If you were jumbling stuff that had no real revolutionary significance, let us say, just all the things you had to do, the number of things you had to pick up at the store, get your cleaning, you had five appointments, you had to juggle them around, you had to be here at a certain time. And consciousness, I don't know why I keep saying consciousness, the molecules of your brain will end up staring just here and staring there, and I keep going through this, and a lot of you will write it down again, and you'll look at it, and you'll think, how true, how true, and you'll stare right at it. <laughs> the only thing you can watch something, the only way that you can watch it efficiently, is by looking around it, not at it. It literally, physically, which is all there is, there is no non-literally, there is no non-physical, just to go back and have to correct myself, there is no way to efficiently watch something by looking at it. You cannot, you cannot guard it. Whatever you see the first time is what you're going to see the last time. There is absolutely no way in which there is any sense proprietary protection, you're in no way involved with the health of that which you're watching if you look at it. You've got to look around it. In areas of life's body, known as the planet Earth right now, the areas that are more advanced have something in common, just more advanced by everybody's definition, which is fine. It is areas where there has been an extensive division of responsibility, division of labor. Let's take the United States, still the prime example. Almost none of you, or none of the population in general, have jobs that has any individual self-sufficiency or a totality of realization of some job. In other words, 
hardly anybody nowadays has a job like a farmer or somebody who builds hammers from scratch, the ironwork and the woodwork. There is a division of labor. Things cannot be advanced in the 3D world without the complexity inherent in a society or a community that has like a production line mentality. The sensibilities of the community have to be built around the kind of complexity to where the individual's particular skill, whatever work he does, is almost of no discernible significance. Now, he may be putting a part in an automobile. Uh, certainly, the, the car won't run without that part. But if you just walk up to him and you're trying to, at the same time, you glance up at the stars and the heavens and the size of the universe, 15 billion miles somewhere across, and then you look at him doing this one thing, and you ask him, if you were out of work and thrown on a desert island, or you thought to yourself, how and what good stead would this ability to put this one bearing right there in the next car you do it, in the next car? And if you even ask the person, the person will say something like, boy, this job is a drag. It's the same crap, and I don't. And they can say that I've got some part in building an automobile, but a dummy could do this. A robot could do it. It's just they can get me cheaper right now than they can import a robot from Japan to do it. There has to be. First, I just want you to see it's not an attack on capitalism or anything, as you know. But for things to be advanced, for there be, to be a kind of progress in the 3D world, there has to be a movement from places where individuals, even families, but individuals can operate self-sufficiently. The prime example being farmers, cattlemen, but somebody that at least himself and perhaps his family, from beginning to end, he can go out and kill whatever had to be killed, raise what had to be raised, put together a house, that if he never saw another human, just him and his wife and his kids, that he could keep them alive. Now you do know, not for some sort of reasons that life is getting involuted and we're going downhill, but for very physical, discernible reasons, you do know that you could not run Western Europe. You could not run any civilized group of people now on that basis. Do I have to give you a second to think about it? You literally cannot. One man cannot, let's say that you feel like you have got to have an oven, a range, a microwave to live. There is no one person probably on this planet right now that could go out from scratch and make a microwave. It just can't be done. Or if it could be done, the son of a bitch would cost what? Two and a half million dollars for each one. <laughs> It simply cannot be done. It has to be divided up so that the larger unit, for the time being, let's say the larger unit being a collection of people known as a nation, but it's in general just areas of life, but let's say a particular nation, that the division of labor is benefiting the larger unit. And of course, ultimately, it's benefiting life or life would not be doing it. But from a relative 3D view, at the same time that's benefiting and making available possibilities for the larger units, it is taking away a kind of self-sufficiency, even the appearance of it, for the individual. As always, you can't go out of the closet. Money is not coming in, money is not going out. All you can do is shift it around. The table stakes are what they start out with. The money is still on the table, and all it does is move around. So, it should be no secret, and these are, all, of course, all relative terms, but in a sense, the individual gives up even the appearance of almost any degree of self-sufficiency, and it limits his abilities, at least the exercise of his abilities. Because if you're going to graduate from high school in the great Northeastern, it was really percolating, the heavy industry built up in the Northeast and the Middle West. You got out of high school, maybe, and you went to work for General Motors, and you didn't have to worry about anything else. Maybe your father got you in with a union, and you got in a particular spot on the assembly line, and you just had one job, and that's all you did. Now, you might go out and root for the home team and hang around the bars and drink beer and play a little softball, but you knew that all you're going to do is this one job, and it took them 30 minutes to train you. And you're going to do that for 20 years and retire with a you know, decent health plan and some union benefits. But the individual, even if he had an interest in expanding his abilities, his talents, the more you are in this complex situation, the less is going to happen to you in a kind of mechanical fashion. That is, at the workplace, you're going to have to go out at night and pay somebody. You're going to have to take night courses and do it on your own. The kind of complexity of the farmer, 
a less civilized person would be faced with. That is, having to be an animal husbandry and agriculture and hunting and you know all that. You are, in a sense, not that you had a choice, but you are sacrificing a wider range of individual abilities, talents, areas of interest, degrees of apparent self-sufficiency for the benefit, although n none of you had any choice in it, but for the benefit, from a relative view, of the larger unit. This is still, you understand, just a setup. A few people just seeing this, that's not a conclusion. That's not the end of it. I keep forgetting about people who just show up in these other cities and maybe the first time they walked in, I can see some people either taking notes or dismissing it like, well, that's pretty good. I wonder what he's going to say next. That was just the beginning <laughs> of this sentence. <laughs> now can you see the second area of correctness? Can you try to? That anything that you can see, you have got to see that it's correct twice. It's correct out there, and it's correct in here. Not relatively so, not metaphorically so. If it's correct, if you can see it out there, you can see it in here. Exactly. Can you see it in the sense that the more civilized you are, and now I'm not just talking about abilities of being able to put together a house on your own or to raise enough food. I'm talking about internally the very things that seem to feed the personality as you people call it, your individual self. That which seems to feed you, that which seems to protect you like your internal housing, how you want, wrap yourself up in whatever it takes to keep you and yourself warm, keep you protected from the elements, not just rain and snow, but the elements of what? Bad vibes, people's poor opinion of me, verbal attacks, everything inside. And we'll assume that all of you meet the classification of being a part of life's more advanced, at least in the 3D sense, in its advanced areas, living here in the United States, and we'll assume that all of you are at least line level, sophisticated and educated, and et cetera. So, if you can see internally what I was just talking about, about nations, areas of life's body, inside of you, the more sophisticated you are, the more cosmopolitan, the more up to date, the more hip, the more with it that you are, the more in you there is a kind of division of labor a division of responsibility that you cannot find that old archetype in anybody nowadays in the city of the self-sufficient pioneer that perhaps in, based on our ages your ages I'm, well, I can guarantee that some of you have still had grandfathers that were probably fairly close to that they're still living out on the land or at least great great grandfathers but now is there anything in you just at a mechanical level that you could really see as being self-sufficient. There seems to be in you divisions of labor that they're little pieces, parts of the partnership. Partnerships can be more than two people, by the way, those of you that never saw fit to waste your time enough to go to law school. There is a kind of division of labor to where in no particular person in you, there is no feeling in ordinary people, ordinarily speaking, that there is somebody inside of me that if worse came to worse, there is one guy in there, one woman in me, that I could always run back there and it'd be like running back perhaps to great-grandfather's farm and I could get away from all this shit here in the city and all the smog and all the slings and arrows of outrageous insults. And he or she can look after themselves and I'd be safe because I could stay right there and stand beside them, sleep in the barn. Most of you can't find anything resembling that in you. The closest you come is the feelings you get sometimes involved with this. And it's to a benefit. It's not that you should go back. You can't go back. You wouldn't want to go back if you understood it. It's not in some way to go back to that time. Just forget all that. Remember, backing up can cause severe tire damage. <laughs> When I say severe, <laughs> but you didn't, do need to see and have an awareness of the fact that what it amounts to is that due to the needs and for the benefit of larger units, when we're talking about people, then we're talking about the larger units being their community, their nation. When it talks about you as one person, then inside of you there's a division into labor to where the larger unit, that is you as a whole, you as a walking around human being with one name and 
one set of skin holding you together, that there is that, but to the benefit of that, internally, there has been a kind of division of labor, a kind of splintering up of processes that used to be closer to being a kind of whole. But the more it became verbal, the more that the nervous system expanded into higher regions, the more the kind of responsibilities seemed to split. And thus you began to almost immediately have the old ideas of this dichotomy between the body and the mind. The accepted reality now, that generally speaking, you can't find somebody that has a above average intellect that seems to be able to function at just the average level of physical people, and vice versa. You don't seem to normally find people that seem to have real, noticeable, perhaps marketable, usable, artistic talents that seem to have either. Most of them are stumble bombs, and most of them can't hardly, can't hardly. <laughs> most of them are not intellectual at all. They just do what they do. So we take that as a given. It's just an accepted fact that that's the way life is. I'm trying to get you to see that that is a natural outcome as reflected out in the way life itself is growing in ways that seem to be out there. The, when it, the more advanced seems to be the area by anybody's definition, the more advanced, the more Putting up Rolling. You need to see that internally, that you've got no choice, you have got to be a part of the more complex situation, but you have got to see that internally the exact same thing has happened to you and all of humanity. That the more you're living in that area, you're simply reflecting what's going on in that area and you're becoming more and more complex and inside of you is a ever-increasing division of labor. Now it goes far enough in certain directions the way some people wire it up and they get to be adjudicated as what? Neurotic, psychotic, in need of help, split personalities. Now, can you see any connection, any possible connection, any possible practical implications between that and where I started tonight. To realize that there is that kind of division of labor that you're dealing with almost an assembly line vis-a-vis -vis your own personality, your own sense of being an individual. It's all split up and you cannot grab anybody there on the assembly line that seems to continually produce you, that they're just turning out every second. You can't seem to go back there and grab anybody and say, what part are you playing in me? The guy says, hey man, I'm union, I put this bearing in here, I don't know. Down at the end there, I know it rolls off some kind of car. In fact, it's you, isn't it? Are you nuts? Why are you asking me? But, but to try and hold somebody in you responsible, some mood, some picture you have of you, the Episcopalian, the middle class, the friend of the downtrodden, whatever picture you've got of you, whenever you have one, to have that and then try to find, well, who is playing a significant role in this? You can't find anybody. And among other reasons, of course, then it's from there, a short step, for another reason, another fuel for the idea that we have unconscious motivations running us individually, if not, according to Harry Young, collective unconsciousness driving us all because there's nobody in me that I can say, all right, who's responsible for this? Never gonna. <laughs> so what are you left with? A real revolutionist is eventually left with this. 
a new partnership, a forging of something, that I understand all this, that you see all that, and it's back to the good old, if you remember one of my time-honored, one of the oldest non-rules that I've ever given you, is once you see what's going on, then fuck it, you just got to press on. So to see, well, there's nobody in me, life is produced, nobody in charge, there's no one I can get my hands on that will take any responsibility. <laughs> Well, not only, it's not that they won't take it, I can't look at them and, and counter, uh, contradict what they say. In other words, my sensation is also. I don't like to think about it, and it's frightening, and most people can't. But I try to find who's in charge, and everybody goes, uh-uh. <laughs> but, coevally, I don't stand there. There's no sensation that they're lying to me. I don't go, yeah, you are, I know it is. They say no, and it sounds like the truth. And then you have to turn away and think, well, what's on TV? I'm hungry. Because you can't stand there saying, wait a minute. I'm me. I'm me all the time. And yet there is no me. Oh, yeah, there is. Or I wouldn't be thinking that. Okay, but why did I think that? Uh, in fact, what am I going to think next? If I'm thinking it, let's see, what do I think next? You can't do it. Ordinary city intelligence, the operations of the brain, will not function like that. You just won't. But once you see, once you get your own grasp, the inside of me, the more complex I am, and all of you are complex enough, all of you are sophisticated and cosmopolitan enough, and only those of you very sophisticated take that as a compliment in some way, but all of you are artistic enough, talented enough, educated enough, sophisticated enough, cosmopolitan enough, urbane enough, witty enough, did not be there enough. Don't write me from out of town. <laughs> that one there enough. All of you meet that qualification, but then you've got to look that this serves a purpose. It plays me in good stead in the city game. I can function. I can pass for being fairly sane. I can get by. I can get a job, hold a job. But then to see that there is no longer even a sensation of any individual self-sufficiency in me. But you can't stop there, or you'll be left with staring at this thing. Is then start looking around at what's going on. At the very areas that you think that you would want to go up and grab somebody, or that you have pictures of you, you have dreams of what you should be doing, and I put the words and the scenario on you of saying you go up and grab the guy or the girl, and you say, all right, are you mainly in charge of what's coming out down there? And they all go, no. All right, don't be looking at them. Don't go up down the assembly line and look at people. You're not watching them. You gotta look around them. That's where you got to look. You look around them and it begins to make some sense, believe it or not. Believe it or not, I think is an outphrase because I could not begin to prove that. And even I'm not dumb enough to even try. But it begins to make sense if you'll look around the thing, not at it. You've been trying to look at things all your life. All your life. What it was that you thought was important. The future of mankind. The relationships with other human beings. Your hope for relationship to the big potato. But all these things, you look right at them. That's the city way. If you're going to learn something, what do you do? You look at it. Not just look at it in here, not just look at it out there. You buy a book. A book that says... A book about the nature of life and other things. And you think, no, 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 I want something more specific. The late, and you find another book that says a book on the nature of life, or it says the son of the book of the na nature of life. You go, no, nah, and you ask the man, I want the book on the nature of life. And he says, I got one copy. And he gets it out, and you're dealing with this. That is, I don't want substitutes, regardless of the fact that Kyra pointed out to you already in the city. They just look at it backwards as always. In the city, the motto is, accept any and all substitutes. That's it. <laughs> but at any rate, the, the, the person believes. This chemical, smelly, oily, and shocking part of the nervous system up here, the brain, says, I want the real thing. And what it's wanting to say is, as it should. Nothing's wrong. People are not incorrect is they want to look right at it. I want the real thing. 
I don't want some book that says it may be about it. I don't want an introductory course. I don't want a book. If I'm going to read the life story of Napoleon, I'd like to find a book. Did he keep diaries? Well, no. Or well, maybe he did. But I don't have a book, but we got one here by his general. I don't know a thing by his general. All right, Josephine, she kept diaries. But are you sure he didn't write any? Well, he did, but we don't have it. Well, I, I'll wait. <laughs> it's, I want the real thing. I want to stare at what I think I'm going to look at. Now, you haven't forgotten my story about watching the person, literally. Now, a lot of you heard that then. It's a fact. That'd be a fact if we were talking about something else. If I was here trying to teach uh, survival techniques, a real revolutionary fifth column guerrilla warfare, then sooner or later, I'd assume I would have stumbled upon that and realized that, that if you're going to teach somebody to get out and you're in charge of watching so-and-so go there guarding the palace, or you're in charge of watching one of our guys go over there, if you're going to guard somebody, if you're going to watch them to do them any good, you can't stare at them. You've got to look around them because they're not going to kill themselves. Regardless of what some of the New Agers think, the person is not going to spontaneously explode. So you don't look at him or her if you're going to help somebody, if you're actually going to look at them and guard them. You look around them continually, not just a little bit, all the time as you look around them. I am disinclined to push, or even attempt to push your noses in this much more tonight. It's right at the very thing that I've been talking about for the last two or three nights. You keep looking at yourself and you think you're doing some good. You've been staring at your fucking self for what? 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, what good did it do? Why do you think one more minute's going to matter? <laughs> How can you be so, so... Oh, all right, dumb. There I said it. How can you be that dumb? Now, in the city, that's all right, because everybody's that dumb. But why are we locked up in these little rooms here and in other cities? The lights turned down, you people watching these tapes. If you just want to be dumb, you don't need me. Well, perhaps I, you know, could add a bit of frosting to your dumbness if I really cared to. But you don't actually need me or anybody to be dumb. We're going to turn the tape over. For you people that need this, that means we take the tape out of the machine. pretend I've changed the subject. Pick up a piece from something else I've been mentioning recently. If you recall, I pointed out to you that no one part of a system, no one part of life, no one part of any larger unit, whatever larger unit is, relatively speaking, it doesn't matter, but no one part of a unit, a system, a thing, ever knows everything about the system or about the thing. No one part ever knows everything about the whole. But now I want you to consider a little bit further. It's one of the reasons, if you remember, is a flawed 3D sound wave and some undertones and overtones. One of the reasons no one thing knows everything about the whole is, is that no one part of it determines what it's going to do. Now, if it did, the first part, we'd have another situation of me saying that no one part knows it all. But no one part of any system, of anything, just no one part of a thing determines what the thing's going to do. Again, I refer you back if I gotta keep this has to do, when I say God nowadays, I assume all of you know I'm using it with a small g because I'm not referring to your religion, anybody's religion, but the whole 
flow of energy through man's nervous system that gets directed through what he's always called stuff like gods, most of the small g's, all the way from, let's say, the Greeks from our Western world on up until today, whatever your parents or your contemporaries idea of a god is. That denotes a non, in fact, at the 3D level, a non-lineal possibility. That is, of one part of a whole, not only knowing it all, but if it knew it all, it would also be, or could, determine what it did. You've got to be able to look around by now and get a feel for this. It's got to just strike you that that is not the case, the observable, the experiential case in life as you know it. There is no sensation, or else you don't belong here, there is no sensation of one force driving this all, of one part knowing everything, or of one part determining it all. They use my kind of pictures, which are still valid. At this level, what you're talking about is some combination of the output of the three forces, but not one of them knows everything about the whole coevally. Not one of them ever determines what's going to be tried of what's going to be accomplished. It's a double aside. Seems like I almost mentioned this once. It's of no great consequence. But the general retelling of the <coughs> Grecian and a little of the pre Grecian myths, if any of you remember, they even had different tiers of gods than what everybody else called the gods. Some of the real intellectual Greeks. Then they came up, they tried to move backwards and say the gods actually were created by some other people. <laughs> Which, as I said, it's no consequence, but you got to give them credit. <laughs> Somebody somewhere, because they had all these ideas of the Olympians. That was the first tier, that was the gods of the everyday people. If I remember the Zeus's and all of his children's. But then they came up with the idea that, wait a minute, The Titans actually created the Olympians. Of course, then they stopped because you can just go on and on. You're playing nestling dolls again because they didn't know where to go with it. But somewhere in life's body, it struck them, hey, this idea that there is a Zeus and that he decides what to do, even their stories. I they got thrown around for a few decades or a few hundred years. Then you had Zeus being drugged, getting caught in somebody else's bed, forgetting what he did, making promises and not keeping them. Which is, which is a kind of very unspecific message that there is no one force knows it all. And as I'm trying to get you to see tonight, there is no one part of the whole ever determines what's going on. But then somebody or some groups or some part of life's body decide, well, hey, let's go back. To, this thing is pretty good until we start all these additional stories about Zeus. So then they had to come up with the idea of Cronus. Whoever it was, actually, that I know for a long time we thought Zeus was it. Now, he was it. He was the head guy. But all these stories kept going, and what they were indirectly telling the nervous system was that guy don't know what he's doing. Now, we all pay homage to him, but that man's out of control. You know, in other words, he's got problems. He's got an unconscious mind, or he's got traumas because the man is not in control. He may be a guide, and so then it was a short step for them. Is wait a minute, you know why? Now, he's a god compared to us. But he's got to answer to somebody. Cronus, he was actually the son of this other guy. And so for a while, I can see some of them had another drink and think, hey, that ain't bad, Cleophas or whatever the guy's name was that came up with the idea. But that ain't bad. You're going places. Anyway, back to you people. You would have to be looking around, not staring, but you look around and you realize that all of the information is never in one spot about the whole, and there is no one place in the body of life that you can observe through any 3D sensual means, that you can observe, that you can think about, you can imagine even. People still think they can imagine anything, they can't, see? They imagine like God, and the first thing you know, their imaginations run into dead end, and then they got to imagine, wait a minute, God had a God. <laughs> There is no one part if you start looking around the thing, not staring at it, but if you start looking around it, it's just quite clear that all the concepts of a soul force, 
of a God outside a system. Are you God? Don't even, I keep trying to drag you people kicking and screaming, at least intellectually, when I keep saying a God outside the system. I keep saying that, hoping that some of you is going one day, even though I tell you it's no great consequences, have a real flash of, ooh, how about you outside your own system? Never mind. <laughs> If you look around it the right way, you see quite clearly that there is no one part of this, whatever you want to call it, life, existence, you, humanity, the race of man, the drama, the mortal drama, from any source, from anywhere you look, anywhere you can feel, you have got to be able to feel very quickly the distinct message. All of the information about the whole is not somewhere. It is not lying in the hands of Mother Church. It is not laying in the racial consciousness of me as an Albanian, as a Greek Orthodox, as a Jew, as a whatever. Nor is it laying in the hands of somebody else, the Pope or somebody. And of course, then if you get a feel for this, it is the intelligence of life itself, what little you can feel and observe of it through ordinary means. But inside the intelligence of life itself, there is no one spot as played out in the life of man that you can observe, there is no one place that knows about the whole, that knows it all about the whole. And there is no one place at any time, there is no one source that is determining what the whole is going to do. Which any of you get a glimpse of that if you've got any of the ferrets and demons still hanging on you from your forefathers' gods, that's just the end of it. Then if you really need something to do, since you don't have the Easter Bunny and all that anymore, then at least go back and I guess dig back up the Grecian ideas. Have a whole bunch of them if you need them. Imaginary playmates. But there is no one source determining even what's going to be tried, much less what gets accomplished. It is not there. And of course, if you have any, still difficult in seeing that, all you got to do is look back into the second area of correctness. Look inside of you and find the one spot that determines what you do. And none of you are that dumb anymore. <coughs> Not unless you're still hung over from St. Quantum's Day. Because <laughs> if you could do that, of course, you could tell me what you're going to say next. There is no place inside of you, there is no one locale anywhere in you that determines what is going to be done by you the whole. And that is true in the 3D sensual world. It is simply not there. You could look at my past picturizations and sometimes lengthy sojourns into my world of the three forces. You can look at that as being a kind of six o'clock wrap up of the story of the division of labor. It gets into finer print and the smaller pieces, but that is about the wrap-up. That is the synopsis of it. And it's not one of them. It's never one of them. No matter whose side you think you're on, of course, if you're on anybody's side, you're done for. You're not a revolutionist. There is no one force determining what goes on. It is the outcome at any given second of some combination between them. And remember, the three is the best you can get your hands on with what you can do now, with what you can see. I never said that was all. But you're talking about some combination that the ordinary intellect cannot predict, because I'm at least trying to hint to you that in a way that can't be really described, is that at a certain level, life does not know any more what it's going to do next than you do. It's just on a better scale, grander scale. I'll quit. For good? I don't know. I think I'll quit for the night. It's within your power to do so. Yes, it is. <laughs> it's a heavy burden. The weight of the crown. I always like Kairu pointing out that all the kings always said that. He had never seen one 
get bad posture or bad back, <laughs> or to take, or to curl off the crown and say, this thing is giving me a neck ache. I don't want to fool it anymore. <laughs> Are ministers that say toiling in the vineyards for the gods is the most heart-wrenching sad thing I could do but you never hear them say I think I'll quit and get a job as a carpenter <laughs> I never have now that I started this I have never seen anyone all dressed up with a pencil thin mustache dancing forward who's ever turned to their partner be it one person a hundred thousand persons and say I'd like to dance backwards a little while would you take over I've never seen that now that I think about it and isn't it good that that has no significance internally to you as an individual just dance on run Rudolph run it'll be Christmas soon and I'll keep dancing I know that I'm going in the right direction 30 years 40 years dancing the same step but yeah I'm close what if it's so much simpler? What if it's simpler than I ever told you? What if it's more simple and direct and straightforward than I've even ever hinted? Since I'm trying to be straightforward and truthful, then I, up until now, then I could hint. Yeah, but well, what if it's not? No, I don't know. I just said, what if it is? Yeah, but it was that simple. Some of those real famous guys that died, yeah, they would have said it that way. Guess you got me there, don't you? <laughs> All right, what if I die and then say it simple? Would that help? <laughs> of course, some of you go, went, yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> Think how much more impressive what I have to say would be if you knew I was dead. <laughs> well, so that always gets a laugh anytime I talk around that area, but how about who do you listen to internally? <laughs> <laughs> All you do is play around what it amounts to is a campfire. It scraps from yesterday, whether it be yesterday or yesteryear. You keep trying to reheat food. And Kairut and I both have told you, don't reheat food. It's more biffic. It'll make you sick. And people continue to do it. But who do you listen to? Where's all the wisdom from? It's from dead people. If they're so smart, why are they fucking dead? If you know what you're doing and you keep talking to you, how come you don't know what you're doing by now? I don't know. I don't want to think about it. I know you don't. <laughs> Is that simple enough? I don't want to think about it. I know you don't. <laughs> I'm glad I never say if there was some possibility that this could be presented in a, possibly could, I said, in a more direct, straightforward, even more simply than I have done. Well, even if you're hinting that could be true, I don't want to think about it. I know you don't. I know you don't. I guess I got confused there. I mixed up several things there at the end. Yeah, I guess I did. I, I don't know. You have to forgive me. I, got, I was talking about one thing, and then I fell into that. Since I already said it, I guess I was just mechanically repeating it about somebody saying, well, I don't think about that. No, I know you don't. I, I know I understand that. I understand that. I know you don't want to think about it. So I, I don't know how I got that confused with whatever I was saying. I already forgot. So don't let that throw you. <laughs> back online once long ago you mentioned that quote you don't fuck around with life or it could or would do you harm what did you mean I do not know which instance the person refers to which I don't guess matters but that sounds like a fair quote from things I have said once or twice that you don't fuck around with life or it could or would cause you harm one other thing they did say I didn't read it all but it says uh, isn't it possible that you could quote fool around with it while you're experiencing it alright to say you fuck around with life 
whatever occasion that person may remember, if any of you remember any occasion I said it, I'm going to have to go on with it in general. There is a way in which you don't fuck around with life. Now, in the city, it doesn't matter that much. Now, if me saying you don't fuck around with life, it can be on this basis. That if you're not involved with something like this, then whether you drink every day or don't drink really has no great pertinence in your life. Now, I know you can say it does. You can say, well, it ruins people's lives in the city. It ruined my family's life. My father was an alcoholic. It killed I know you can say all that, but what I'm saying is that it does not have the kind of permanent individual effect that people, have, that life has made people say that it has. That is, to really back up a little bit, for those kind of very strict Puritanian religions, Puritan religions that would even say that the cons mere consumption of alcohol will send you into the great pit, that you will cross over the great river Lethe. Those of you who call you Hades aficionados, <laughs> one of the root bases of our word lethal, if you remember that great river in Hades, is the dead go there and they sip it and it has one distinct effect, which is what? Forgetfulness. In the city, ordinary people, what I was going to say, it does not have that kind of Effect. It is not dooming people to eternal torment, etc. But you should be able to see the complexity of life and life needing to grow all the time that it cannot tolerate widespread alcohol. It cannot tolerate, at least for the purposes of humanity are serving now, that at any given time some large percentage of humanity is staggering around like they have been sipping out of the great river. That is, they hardly know their name, they don't know what they're doing, they can't get to work. That's not the way things are supposed to be, not back in the city. Here, there is a point past which that you don't fuck around with life that you understand that things must flow in a certain direction. Now, I keep giving little hints, and I've even given some absolute demands for you people for a while, which ultimately become moot, but by saying that I'm not going to tolerate or try to deal with you on some regular basis if you're regularly going to drink, or if you're going to fool around with recreational drugs, because it's me trying to push a car with May pops on the tires up a slick mud hill. It's just, you're, not, you're not going anywhere. You're spending your energy in ways that don't bother me at all. You can be a drunk. You can sniff all the cocaine you want, but I'm not going to try and deal with you. I just can't. It's a waste of time, at the very least. So I can say that. But ultimately, anybody correctly involved with this, you don't need me to tell you squat about those kind of rules. You simply understand that you can't do it. If you don't understand, you don't even belong here. You don't need me to say you can't drink on a regular basis. You can't do drugs on some kind of regular basis. You, can't, you shouldn't even be fooling with them and expect to do this. After just a short period of time, you know that. I just happened to mention it. But you would have found it out anyway. You just do it. And you find there are ways that you can't treat people. Not for any religious reason, not for any moral, not for any ethical reasons. There are things that you can no longer do because you mistreat your opportunity, which is singular enough and weird enough, you mistreat yourself, and ultimately, those that really get undumb enough, you realize that based upon the first part, that is the opportunity that you got, you end up hurting life, and that's fucking around with life. There is a way in which I'm not going to go into anything that even <coughs> sounds remotely mystical. For some of you with oatmeal potential for brains, <laughs> But there is a kind of responsibility, there is a kind of expectation that some of you have had whiffs of, you don't know what to call it necessarily, but you get involved with this up to a certain point, and it's not mystical. But I'm just telling you there is more demanded of you. And forget that there's some God or some force, three forces, one force, oatmeal force, prune force. Forget what, you go far enough, and there are things that you can't do. There are people that you can't return hostility to, and parts of you would like to whip their ass. And when they turn their back, and if life turns their back, even if you don't whip their ass, when they turn their back and walk off, you may go. I'm just saying you may. That was kind of a funny thing. But there are things that you cannot any longer do, and there's no reason. It's not because I told you not to. It's not because you're any longer tied to moral responsibilities, as they're talked about in the community. But there comes a point that people involved with this cannot fuck around with life. Life's best interest is your best interest. Nobody's got to tell you. It's not a club to join, and nobody checks up on you. 
but life can harm you. And it does not single you out and decide, hey, I gave you a chance. And look what you did. I'll get you. But you get in a position within the complex scheme of the division of labor, you end up knowing things that nobody around you knows. Nobody. Nobody. Well, me and you, I'm the only one that you suspect at all. But I'm the only one that you can't see for sure. But you look around and you just realize, just some little area, I'm not going to give an example, but you understand in some ways there are things that you now know that nobody on this planet knows as far as you can tell. Nobody here in your vicinity, except me. That nobody knows it. When you know that, there's a kind of new responsibility. It's not theoretical, it's not moral, it's not spiritual. It's the damn weight of the laws of physics. It's the flow, the natural flow of the molecular structure of life in the city. There's simply things that you can no longer do. And there's some things you can't refrain from doing. And if you do, you're fucking around with life. As I said, this becomes, in a sense, a fruitless attempt for me to hurl enjoiners and exhortations upon you, because if you reach that point, you know this anyway. And it can't be proven. I wouldn't try to prove it, and I wouldn't even have to tell you. But I have tried to give a few warnings, and, which is my normal basis that the person that I would say something like the person brought out of about there's certain ways you don't fuck around with life because you can get hurt. It is knowing, knowing that you see something that life in general has not let other people see, has not made them see, has not required them to see, and not to live by that. You can get hurt. And I'm not trying to be melodramatic because the worst you're going to get hurt is you're going to die. That's the way most people look at it. But you can get hurt in that the opportunity you had and whatever you gained you can't almost blow it. Life can really mash upon you in a way that is unmystical, in ways you never read about, in so-called holy books, in ways that ministers and rabbis and priests holler, oh, the pain in my soul to have to do the Lord's work. That's kindergarten do. Life can lean on you in ways you never heard about. Once there's no doubt in your mind that you belong in this, and once you begin to see anything, once you begin to realize that there is literally a level of consciousness of life, and that the thing is alive from top to bottom, there are no dead spots, and once you realize that there is a level of intelligence of everybody, your mother, your father, the Pope, presidents, prime ministers, kings, they're all operating within certain limitations that just like that, and that's the level of everybody. No matter how educated they are, no matter how many international conferences they've been to, no matter how many degrees they have in some specialized field, you realize there's this level, and then you realize that among everybody you know, you now know more. Not in some area, not in putting a bearing in the front of a car, not in building a house in a particular way, not of being an architect or a doctor or an attorney, but that you actually see the level of everybody else's intelligence. You begin to see how life works that life does work, you begin to see life alive. And at that very moment, there are ways that you can no longer fuck around with life, ways that in the city didn't mean anything, things you've done all your life you can no longer do. There's no burden I me saying life can weigh on you. I was talking about the kind of ways that could push you back. Simple living by it is no burden. Once you got any notion about what you're doing, you by God better do it. That was a cheap way to end. You don't, let me read. I, I never do this, do I? They can vouch for me. Let me retract that. That doesn't sound right. Let me rehabilitate that. If your grace will allow, one more comment. I shouldn't have to tell you, you better not do that. Once you begin to see what you're doing, you'll do it. And then I guess all of you, will, even out of town, everybody will be moving here. But once you see that, 
That's it. Now buy again. Except. <laughs>